I'll be just slightly more over cheers. Yeah. Hi, Lynn. Um, I've just spoken to Charles and he agrees we should just reschedule it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, and I'll let my students know. Mm -hmm. All right. Who? Oh, right. Oh, bless her. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Hello, hello. Sorry, um, the the class is just about to start. So I'll um, I'll all right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, we've had to cancel this afternoon because there's a really large number of students can't get here. Um, because of the, tr the trains wow, yeah. and also they don't know if they can get home because mm -hmm. the weather is supposed to come back again later this, this afternoon. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch the first part. The, yeah. the lecture, this af the lecture and workshop for the yeah, yeah. EAL this afternoon at one thirty. that's being rescheduled. Okay. I'll just I'll hang around here and I'll just sit okay. there. Is that okay? Yeah, that's absolutely yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, that way, when I've just sent them a message saying they, can, they want to send messages so you can be here and you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Once the new presentation is finished, then I'm going to Skype, push the button, switch over to the next one, and then we'll have that up on the screen and that camera will be keeping through. That's good. That's, that's great. Thanks a lot, Derek. Well, it was quite extreme yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. It was on the West Coast as well. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I know. Just still have, like, it's a bit more Yeah. So, will we be able to hear them then, Derek? <coughs> Not through the main presentation, but no, but at the end. Dial in with the Skype. All yeah. oh, right, right. It might be the case that if there's like um, a lot of people there, there might be someone, someone sharing it to repeat ah. questions depending on what sort of microphone. No pressure. Got, huh? <laughs> okay. Yeah, All right. So we're going to Skype them at the end, so that we'll be able to take questions from there and here. So you can make questions up so you look like ask something. <laughs> Don't come up with something really difficult. <laughs> and I'll go, um, <laughs> not actually sure. <laughs> Did it work? Yeah, we should be alive, man. Alright. Um, I emailed you the link just in case you want to check. Uh, should I just send them a message and say the link should be live? Yeah, make sure you can see it in here. That works.
<laughs> and like that's them saying that they're good to go. Well, is that them ready now? Yeah. This is Shane, is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So can they hear us now? Do I need, do I need, oh no, I've got this one right. The lecture for what? For everybody else at 12. Yeah. Just yeah. Have, you, have you just got an email? I've seen them. Oh, no, I'm just texting my phone. Yeah, everything's cancelled. All right. Okay. <laughs> so I'm just waiting for Barry now, is that right? God, I just checked that. <laughs> Barry, if I move, is it okay if I move to point something on the screen? Yeah, or, sure. Yeah? Yeah, okay. the, the boundary? <laughs> Okay, shall we make a start this morning? Um, welcome everybody, good to see you. And we'd also like to welcome um, the students from Co South Korea and to welcome you this morning um, to the lecture on English as an additional language. And we'll be covering a variety of topics throughout this um, lecture to look at some of the needs and some of the contextual constraints and how that then impacts on us when we consider teacher education, language development and teacher identity. So some of the aims are to provide um, information about the diverse nature of EIL learners in Scotland and to look at them as a population and to provide information about second language learning theories. We're going to touch on just a few. We can't do a comprehensive account of that, but we're going to take some out of the theory that helps to link and helps us to understand um, what learners are facing. And we're also going to consider how the shifting context within the UK and also globally um, impacts on teacher education and teacher identity. And at the end, we'll look at a few slides that we'll explore later within workshop contexts, the types of strategies that can be helpful for uh, in the classroom with learners that are learning English as an additional language. Does that sound OK? OK. If we look at the nature of diversity in Scotland, there has been a rise in the number of migrants, and that is non-UK born and non-British national populations. And we see from um, many years, we've seen a continued rise in the number of migrants that have come to Scotland and across the UK. The National Office for National Statistics provides nice graphs for this, but they haven't done any for 2013 and 14 yet. But their narrative data shows that this is a continued increase with um, more migrants coming into the UK and particularly in Scotland. And what I thought was interesting for Scotland within their website, 
was that the migrant share of the population across different areas of Scotland was looking at the bigger cities, so the bigger kind of urban areas like Aberdeen and Edinburgh and Glasgow City um, have noticed a dramatic shift within their populations, particularly within schools. So when we go to the local authorities and we speak to them about the types of learners that are in schools and in the classrooms, they'll say we've had a dramatic increase almost on a weekly basis um, in terms of migration and the students that are coming in. Glasgow and Edinburgh look like they're on a par for the number of students that are coming in, but Glasgow always seems to earn the reputation of having more of a migrant population, maybe because the refugee centre is situated there for the UK, so that could be one of the reasons. But you can see an, in an increase in terms of the percentage of the population within these different areas. When you look at the statistical bulletin for Scotland, it shows the current um, details show that pupils learning English as an additional language have been identified. They've split them between male and female, but the total population is 29,532. And I think we should always look at statistical details with a kind of a health warning sometimes because these don't necessarily represent the population of pupils learning English as an additional language uh, and that's because of the process that we use for collecting this data. So we often leave it to either the school secretary to record this type of data or we may get families that don't want to actually record that they speak other languages at home so the data itself doesn't necessarily represent the number of students that are learning English as an additional language. In fact I think the most recent is that there's about 43,000 learners um, who are English as an additional language, but this only records the ones that are receiving some kind of support within schools. So we see that there's a whole population and when we start to look at the types of learners there are, you will see how this diversity can't be easily recorded. So some schools in Edinburgh have noticed, um, they've re reported back to us that they've seen a large increase, particularly within primary settings so that in primary one and primary two, they're almost some of their classes are 90% bilingual. And this has presented their teachers with enormous challenges because the training aspect that they've um, faced within their own training as teachers doesn't necessarily address how to uh, meet the needs of such a diverse cohort of students. And when you look within our Scottish schools, there are 146 languages represented. And that in itself, um, creates a really diverse context for how children learn, how they process language, how they think about culture, and teachers need to know this type of information in order to meet the needs well. Does that make sense? When we look at our policy within Scotland, the mainstream is considered to be a space where students can come and have their needs met, and they sh they're the type of information that we give out in policy is to look at how the, we develop the type of language and literacies that are needed to access a common curriculum. So the mainstream teacher has that responsibility of helping all the learners within her classroom or his classroom to enable the learners to access a very common curriculum. And if we look in Scotland and across the rest of the UK, um, where diversity is, is growing rapidly, we see that English as an additional language is seen to be a teaching and learning issue and policy doesn't tend to address it as a, a policy issue. Um, when we look at the learning of English uh, in Languages for Life, we have a policy um, quote there. The learning of a second or additional language happens most effectively when the focus is not on learning language but on learning something, something else through that language. And so that means if we're learning our content, so each of you are from different subject areas. If we take history or mathematics or science, the policy context and a lot of the people that are working in schools feel that language develops better when you're learning something, some content that goes alongside the language learning. But the problem with that is it can spark a lot of folk theories and that means that the teachers then think that they just, because they're in this rich environment of learning your subject area, along with um, language, that the students will just pick up the language automatically. So there's a, there are some constraints with how we present policy. If we look internationally, and 
in the UK as a whole, the common curriculum, that everybody gets the same curriculum, they have access to the same learning, they have access to the same content as those that are from native English speaking backgrounds. What happens is because we want, we're, our goal is to have everybody receive the same, we flatten difference. We don't recognize difference because we want everybody to receive the curriculum that we've constructed as a nation. And this is happening across America, across Canada and Australia. Other Anglophone countries are finding the same experience that a common curriculum flattens difference and doesn't recognize it. So cultural difference is something that we don't necessarily highlight um, within our lessons. And we, we looked at that last Monday when we looked at culture and how that impacts on classrooms. So the way that policy has been interpreted has often resulted in an undifferentiated mainstream where EAL learners end up being submersed in the classroom. And there's always a kind of metaphor that goes along with that with the sink or swim attitude to, to learning, that we put you in this environment and then you just swim for your life until you can learn um, ways of surviving within that classroom. So they've got that kind of metaphor that attaches to it. It's quite a complex context for EIL learners and for classroom teachers. So who is the EIL learner? If we looked at the, the migration um, slides that were earlier, who is this learner? Because they're not a homogenous group. And I like the quote by Meltzer and Hamann, pupils who use two or more languages in their everyday lives. And they may not use those languages in the same way. They may use those languages at home with their grandparents. Um, they may use their home language. And then when they come to school and they're out in the community, they're using English. But they're using these languages in their everyday communication. And they also, their opportunities to develop English language literacy to grade level has not yet been fully realized. So they're not necessarily at a level with their native English speaking peers but they're, they're trying to catch up with a moving target um, when we look at the native speaker of the students who have English as a native language. So as I mentioned, these are, they're not a homogenous group and they may or may not receive language support. So even though you've got a learner in your class who is struggling and not able to keep up with the lesson or doesn't have English um, as a language to, in which to access the curriculum, they may not be receiving language support. And the reason for that is there's a lack of funding. And it's also, um, it's also related to policy and how we see what support is needed for the classroom. Because if policy says they'll learn within a rich environment and they'll pick the language up, then they don't feel that it's necessary to address the needs, the needs of these students with individual one-to-one -one tuition. Some EIL pupils are literate in their home language, while others may not be. They may have limited literacy and not know how to read and write in their home language. It may only be a spoken language. Um, some are second and third generation migrants. They were maybe born in this country, but they've not yet developed the advanced literacy skills to access the mainstream curriculum. And if we look at Lynn Cameron's work on vocabulary development, she highlights across a study where she looked at what we would call advanced learners of English as an additional language that were second and third generation migrants. They were fluent orally, but they didn't have the advanced literacy with which to access the curriculum and their vocabulary was much lower than their native English speaking peers. You'll also have groups of EIL learners where they have developed fluent conversational skills and they've developed literacies associated with reading and writing but they have no conversational skills. Um, so their oral language may be deficient in some way, but they're very good in the written language and in reading. Um, help students access this common curriculum that we give to them when they enter our school system. We'll have a question time at the end, so um, make sure if you've got any questions on the slides that you can write them down and we'll try to answer and make things a bit clearer. When we look at the local context, just as we've done, 
and across the UK. And we also look at the global context. We can see similarities, but we, there are also some differences. And I think within Scotland, what is striking within our teacher education standards and our policy guidelines is the omission of EIL as a required and distinct area of training for mainstream teachers. That is different to England. Scotland is very different in that sense. England has specific standards that address EIL. There are only two, but it does highlight that teachers need to be aware of how to meet the needs of such a diverse population. So studies in Scotland and England, if we look at some of those that have been done, and we're needing to do much more research in this area um, so that we learn and we're able to change our education system based on this, that despite this policy of mainstreaming where all students are put in the same classroom and they receive the same education and curriculum as those that were native speakers of English in Scotland, not much has changed in practice. We still continue to practice the submersion approach where learners are put in the class and expected just to learn English in order to access the curriculum. And as I was telling you this week, this is not anything to do with necessarily with teacher attitude. Many teachers want to support EIL learners, but they don't necessarily have the tools to do it. And also the fact that policy has promoted a folk theory that language can just be picked up by being immersed in a situation. If we look at um, international literature across the United States and other Anglophone countries, it shows that the knowledge base of teacher education programs needs to change. It needs to learn how to accommodate diversity better. So although we may look to the United States and Canada and Australia in particular, because they seem much further ahead than we are in the UK, they are still struggling with the same things. They're still looking at their teacher education programs and trying to figure out how do we help to accommodate such change within our student population. And I'm sure our South Korean students will keep us right on this, especially as we come to the question time at the end. But South Korea, from what our readings in the literature, show that um, it's been typically considered as an ethnically and linguistically homogenous nation. But you're now experiencing growing numbers of migrants, and that brings changes itself within the nation that are much more visible now. So if we look at that globally, all of us as, as countries um, it challenges our ideology, it challenges how our ideologies of education and what that should look like, what our curriculum should be structured like. We see that within the discourses within our society itself, within the media, how it promotes anything that's different, how it talks about it. Um, and it helps, it not only um, challenges our own ideologies of what we feel about diversity, but it actually challenges us to define who we are as teachers. So who are you when you go into your classroom? What kind of teacher are you? Are you a Scottish um, or English, white, monolingual, monocultural um, trained teacher? Is that what we're training you to be? Or do we need to challenge ourselves as teacher educators to say, we're not necessarily equipping you in the way that you need to be um, for these diverse contexts. So our feedback and our dialogue together as you go into schools helps change us and as we engage in research it brings changes in us and helps us to see what your needs are and so that hopefully that brings about much more change and it helps us to expand our horizons as teacher educators as we seek to serve the different populations within our society. I've put a slide up here um, looking at some data that we had collected and you'll see that the pri I've put primary and secondary school data and we can see very common comments from teachers, very similar comments about how language develops. So when they were asked questions like how do you think English as an additional language develops and how do EAL learners learn that language within your classroom? you can see that they think, well, I think it depends on how quickly they pick up. So they start using that metaphor of um, they just learn that language automatically. Or you see, I wonder just how much language he's taking in. We see the responsibility for language learning is given to the learner rather than it being a joint process between the teacher and the learner. And that was something that was quite noticeable within the data that we collected. We can see where he says he's beginning to pick up the language quite well. 
So that's a, that's a notion that teachers carry with them. It's a belief and it underpins any choices that they make within the classroom. In the secondary school, you can see it again. Maybe he's not been exposed to that word enough. And so the exposure and the picking up and all of those types of words are common across the, the data that we, that we collected. And I particularly thought the last one, it will hopefully just arrive. So this teacher was saying, this must be true. This must be the way that they learn language because they're, in, they're mainstreamed in the common curriculum and they're experiencing the same as other learners. So hopefully it will just arrive for them. So how do we challenge those perceptions? Teachers that have been in practice for a long time, been in schools, how do we meet their needs to change their training for the continued shift within our student populations? I've put a slide in here about attainment because, and although this relates to the English population, there are strong similarities within some of the data we've collected in Scotland. And here you can see, I'm just going to point to this with the, um, the light here, the average pup pupil progression, you see a continued, this is an idealistic graph by the way, a continuum that shows that they make their way through attainment um, to a particular level in terms of their academic performance. And when they, um, the, the required EAL progression, you can see that they have to start here, but there's a huge gap that they have to be able to catch up. So they're constantly trying to meet a moving target, but they've got more of a, a much steeper incline depending on which year they come into school. So if they come in in key stage three and they have to catch up with their peers, they're having to make a much um, more complex um, sense of achievement and, and way of making progress in their learning than those that may have come in earlier. So age and when you enter school has a lot to do with how well you're going to do. And when I was collecting data for some of the studies we were involved in, um, I, I found a very sad situation in a classroom that I was in because one of the learners was from Iraq and she was a girl, she was 16. And this was the first time that she had ever been in school because she was a girl and within her country, um, girls were not allowed to go to school. And so when she was sitting there, her, the, the progress that she was going to have to make in order to catch her peers was quite significant. Not only did she not speak a word of English, but she wasn't familiar with the school system. She didn't know language to ask how to go to the bathroom. And so the teacher had no idea what to do because our teacher education programs don't prepare teachers for these types of diverse contexts. And so we're challenged in ourselves as teacher educators. How do we equip the student teacher population much better? And we're constantly thinking of that and working towards it um, because our aim is to help learners and student teachers contribute as members of society that will have a good impact. Right, some of the, we've talked a little bit about lear learning theories when we look at what teachers say, but I'm just going to go through a few slides now that help us to see some of the learning theories about language that are in schools and within the literature uh, in relation to English as an additional language. Now, I know that you're familiar with Jim Cummins and we've looked a little bit at him, but often when we think about bilingualism, we, s we think of the brain and we think of how the brain operates. And I was going to say in the olden days, but actually it's still a current theory. Some people see the brain divided in two. So there's two little brains. And they see that as having language one and then language two. And I'm not sure where they put language three, but they have a very um, kind of uh, distinct way of looking at how the brain processes language, that it does it separately. But Jim Cummins talks about there being a common underlying proficiency. Language is language, so no matter what it is, there are common principles and common mechanisms and processes that the brain draws on in order to understand and make meaning. And so he sees it as the brain um, having, having one brain, fortunately, and that process taking place. He also starts to see this common underlying proficiency that he's mentioned as an iceberg. He, he, he depicts it in two different ways. 
and often at the tip of the iceberg we'll see the very surface features of the first language and then the second language but underneath we've got this common area that the brain draws on in order to understand and process language so if you have a that's when translation works sometimes if you have something in one language and you translate it into another there's often a common un understanding that lies in the brain but that doesn't work all the time because my own experience of learning Chinese, some words don't translate readily. They don't translate easily from one language to another. And sometimes it's a whole different concept that's attached to it. And so, although there's a common under, underlying proficiency, um, it's not always an easy process. So Jim Cummins does have some weak points in, in his um, understanding of bilingualism or how he presents it but is very good in terms of how to begin to understand bilingualism. He also um, has put on the kind of, he uses it as a metaphor really of a home, or you're looking at a building, and he looks at it as threshold theory. And what he means is that you have to have reached a certain level of language before you can proceed to the next level. So you must have a certain number of vocabulary or a certain number of grammatical structures in order to pr proceed from being a limited bilingual to somebody who's more kind of balanced in the way that they learn language. And he sees it as a process of learning where you go from one threshold to the next and as you gradually increase vocabulary and knowledge of language, then your proficiency will increase in the language. But there are also limitations, and he recognizes those himself as other people engage with him in the theoretical world. So what is it that we need to know? Often teachers will say, it's just good practice. But actually, if you have a very multicultural classroom and you have learners that maybe don't have as much English as some others, it's more than good teaching, it's more than good practice. You need to have a knowledge of language acquisition, you need to have a knowledge of culture, which we looked at this week, and we need to have a knowledge of literacy and how that impacts on the learner, especially if they're from another cultural background. So if we look at words in particular, um, by the age of five, children generally know, native speakers of English in their L1, their first language, know three to 5,000 words. And that's something that grows as they mature and grow older through school. After the age of five, children acquire a thousand word families each year. And what I mean by word families is that it's not just the individual word, but it's the rest of the family that goes with that word. So it's when it adds an ED or when it adds an ING, they know how to manipulate those words and to take them on and use them appropriately. And that's something that continues through school and builds. And when you think of where you get to when you're five years old, and then you put an EAL learner into the same class, they've got a lot to catch up on when it comes to English language. And so they're continually trying to reach a moving target. Uh, critical age theory is another uh, theory that you will see when you start to look at your assignment. Um, but it also, this correlates with um, second language development in the fact that some researchers state, Steven Pinker in particular, that when you get to a certain age, that is a critical period exists. And he states that when children are exposed to language until the age of six, they are guaranteed normal development. Um, others have challenged this. So with any theory, there's always other opinions and ways of looking at it. So from age six to puberty, he then says this ability or this development is diminished. However, others have challenged that because he also states that after puberty, normal development rarely occurs, but we have many adults that are balanced bilinguals, that are fluent in many languages, and so and there are other countries that grow up learning different languages. So there are many challenges to the critical age theory, and not everybody necessarily believes that. But you know, when I was learning Chinese, I think I was, I was in my late 20s, and I remember our language teacher saying to me, oh, you don't have much time left, you know, to learn Chinese because you're getting old and your brain won't be as elastic as it should be. Mm -hmm. And so you need to make sure that you're, you're learning as fast as you can. And, and I thought, that, that can't be right because there are 70-year-olds learning this language and they seem to be doing a pretty good job. So I tried not to let that theory 
influence what I was doing. Other second language acquisition perspectives come from Himes and Krashen, and I'll just say a little bit about them. Um, Himes talks about the importance of social context, and we've talked about that as a, a group. And the social conditions that we live in, our cultural conditions, the things we believe, the things that we value, the ways that we make meaning, all of those influence how we learn language. So if you look at your classroom, the social conditions that you structure within that and that you encourage and promote, that's going to impact on how language is learned. So if you're aware of culture, if you bring that out as a normal part of the discussions that you have in your classroom, then you're going to create an environment where language is more easily understood and learned. He also talks about the sociolinguistic approach where looking at talk. Talk is very important when you're learning a language. And although a lot of it in, our, in the past, and historically we've tended to engage with a more grammar translation approach where we look at written structures and we, we memorize those, the sociolinguistic approach puts an emphasis on interaction and dialogue. So providing your learners with the opportunity to talk, even if it's broken, even if it's not as structured or as fluent as it should be, creating a safe environment for those learners to be able to take a risk. Take a risk in asking a question, take a risk in making a mistake. That's all necessary as language develops because if we think back to when we were children, that's what we did in the home. We took risks, but it was within a safe environment where those types of um, opportunities were encouraged. So Krashen is also um, another theorist. He talks about the input hypothesis and he also talks about a silent period. So if you think about children when they're very young, even as babies, they're not just lying, not engaging with the world, they're actually processing even though they can't make a sound that's comprehensible. They go through a silent period of process and they're taking language in and processing it internally. And sometimes we have learners in our class, um, we've actually given them a term in Scotland, which I, I'm not necessarily sure I like. We call them elective mutes. We've been calling EAL learners elective mutes, and that's people that choose not to speak. Um, I don't necessarily like the term because it doesn't represent the fact that there's actually a learning process taking place. They're not mute, they're engaged actively in trying to understand and make meaning. But they will maybe go through a silent period where they won't talk in your class for a number of months and not to be worried by that, but to re recognize what's happening to them. Comprehensible input is also promoted by Krashen and he promotes this model for the learner where they learn something at their level of understanding. So we simplify the material and then we give it to them just one level above. So it brings in Vygotsky's zone of proximal development, but it also um, looks at simplification of materials. So if you have a text in your classroom, you may simplify that in order to help them gain access and understand what's happening at their own level of understanding. There are problems with these theories because not everybody fits into a theory well. And so you'll see lots of discrepancies um, because some learners are very um, able in their first language and won't necessarily learn the simple language first. They want to learn the more difficult conceptual language. So we have that constraint within the theoretical approaches. I think Jim Cummins likes icebergs because he uses them a lot. Um, and we talked a little bit previously about Bix and Calp. And Bix are the basic um, interpersonal communication skills that our learners have and you did a presentation on that right at the beginning of term um, and CALP is also something that is below the surface and that's cognitive academic language processing and proficiency um, and what we see above the surface so every day when you come into class you may see the English language learner engaging in really fluent conversation telling his peer to stop doing that and you think oh he's even got a Scottish accent so he must be fluent so any academic difficulties or challenges he's having must be because he's got a learning problem and so what happens is is because we see this as fully developed spoken language which takes one to two years to develop this can create a false um, security 
because we tend to think the learner has grasped the language and is flu as fluent as everybody else. And it looks like that on the surface. But underneath, the academic language takes much longer to develop. It takes five to seven years based on some studies um, in the United States who tracked students over a long period of time to look at how long it took them to catch up. You know the attainment slide that we looked at? How long does it take them to make that trajectory up towards their native speaking peers? Um, and so under here you'll see different um, examples of what they're able to do. And I'll give you an example of that. In their first, this is a first language graph. So the social language you can see in red, um, that develops quite quickly. There's a trajectory there. And then the academic language, they learn almost, and there's not too big of a gap between, between these two. So you can see that when we go to school, we start to process how we learn academic language and we learn new terminology, new ways of expressing ourselves. But when you look at the second language, which is this one here, you can see they start later, but they have to make a steep incline up to, to, to meet them. So this shows that with the basic interpersonal skills and then with the academic skills, you can see it takes much longer on this graph. There's much more of a, 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 a kind of gap between that. And to show you what the everyday language looks like, Often when we use spoken language to talk about things, we may say there's no food in the country. So, for example, if we were in geography and we were looking at a famine and we were wanting to say, well, what was happening? Well, there was no food in the country. We may say that in spoken terms, but when it comes to writing an academic text, we can't use spoken language. We have to use a different register. So we would use terms like widespread famine. And you can see that there are fewer words that have been conceptualizing the fact that this longer sentence um, is and it's expressing the same but with this we can talk about lots of different famines we, but with spoken language we generally focus it in on one specific local famine and you can see other examples there they had to get out of their house but the academic word may be something related to eviction so it's, it's conceptualized in one specific term we might talk about old people as we're talking on the bus or talking to our friends, but if we were writing it in a, in a paper or a report, we would maybe use the word elderly. And you can see it a lot with, um, it rained a lot, we would use the word flooding um, in more academic texts. So the language is different and how we help them gain both spoken and academic is one of the challenges that we face. So we're coming to the end of the, this lecture now and there'll be time for questions at the end, but I wanted to show you something else by Jim Cummins because he talks about, um, he, he has a, a framework that he uses for trying to think about how we would design our tasks. And he looks at these different dimensions and you can see that they're on either ends of the scale. So he talks about context embedded tasks or opportunities and then context reduced. And you can see that here and over here. But he also talks about some tasks being cognitively undemanding. They don't require a lot of the, the brain. They're easy to do. And then other tasks that are more cognitively demanding, requiring us to uh, process things at a much more difficult level. And I have a colleague that has fitted in some um, different types of tasks that we may require in our lessons for students to do. Um, so if you look in this domain here, it's cognitively undemanding and it's also very contextually embedded. So there's a lot of context given to the learner engaging in this, telling their own stories. It might be a dialogue taking place. They know the story. They're drawing on what they know. And so there's a lot of context. Talking about the weather, we could do that today because not many of us have been able to get in. And so there's a context that surrounds it and it's not too demanding cognitively. But when we come down to school settings, where we reflect on arguing a case or sustaining or justifying an opinion, the context is reduced because we're not often in a dialogue. We're often requiring students to write about this. The argument is outside of the context usually. They're drawing on what they've learned from um, past experience. Um, they're trying to interpret evidence and it's very demanding cognitively. 
And when you think of a second language learner, this is increased even more for them when we put them into this, con this domain all of the time. So when we design our tasks, how are we going to help move them along in the different domains by providing context but also helping to make sure that we're considering the cognitive domains too. Right, so the last couple of slides are looking at some examples of good practice and we have um, EAL services that have put things together to try and help teachers understand some of the things that they can keep in their head to help. Allowing children to use their home languages in the classroom while speaking and writing. Um, I worked in a school once where the rule of the school was don't allow them to speak their home language, they must only speak English. And this was written into the policy of the school. And it was seen as a way not to exclude other languages, but it was seen as a way to help them. They thought the more English they spoke, the better that would um, develop. But our, our folk theories again often get us in trouble because bilingual theories tell that if you draw on both languages within that common understanding, that one brain, you're going to have better language development in English. Using scribing when appropriate, sometimes the teacher scribes, writes something for the student, sometimes a peer will do it um, in order to help if they're at a level where they're not able to write in fluent English. Setting up buddy systems, um, Charles and I interviewed um, and another colleague, we interviewed quite a number of pupils and the one thing they all commented on that was really valuable to them was a buddy system and that was having one of their peers who was come alongside of them and support them and help them whether that was to explain what the teacher was talking about whether it was to show them how the school worked um, the buddy system was important and they often said that person's still my friend even four years later so this was a key thing that they mentioned allowing opportunities for children to make links between the topics that they're studying and their own experiences, providing opportunity for them to say, well, in our country, this is what we do. This is how I understand this topic. But in our country, we may do it differently. So help them to draw on that and bring their own culture into the classroom is going to change everybody in the classroom, including us. We learn from students. Um, using visuals. In fact, one of, the, um, one of the students that I spoke to said that English was the most difficult subject in school for being an EAL learner. And that was because the use of vid visuals was reduced in that compared to other classrooms like geography or modern foreign languages or, or different maths even. It was just much more visual. So using pictures, using media in order to help support the context and understanding of what we're trying to develop. Um, using pair and group work, we talked a little bit this week about how important that is, that if we go around the class or we put students into pairs that we don't isolate the EAL pupil because they can't speak English. <coughs> Let them use their first language to maybe make notes of things. Let them use their interpreter that they've been given and a teaching assistant. Bring the first language into the classroom, but not only so that, uh, for them to learn English make it a part of your classroom their whole life. Your goal is to make them a multilingual citizen within Scotland, not for them just to learn English. Rather than us seeing English as the most valued language, let's bring other languages in as much more v valuable or in the same way so that we're not highlighting one and diminishing another. And so that's an important concept um, to, to practice. And when the child we, we look at the child or the EIL learner to see them as a resource within your classroom. They've got knowledge from their own country, their own family context. And to see that as a resource that's going to change those in your class that are native speakers of English because they also need to develop an understanding of the world. And some of those strategies we're going to unpack within the workshops that we engage in for the EIL day. And we'll also be looking at that as we continue through this course as you go into schools. So thank you for listening. I know it was a lot of information to take in, but if we have questions, let's make some time for that. And, um, or even any comments, it doesn't necessarily have to be a question. It can be a comment that you have to add to that.
for this. <clears throat> That's a question that we've had come through there. But we'll wait until we just dial in. Okay. Time. There's a slight delay with the live stream, so we're just waiting for them to catch up. Mm -hmm. we'll switch over to Skype. So feel free to contribute to the questions that are asked. Don't don't just sit quietly. You can you can answer the question too. And can you can draw on your experience and placements and talk to the students within Korea. It's really small, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I must just need new glasses. Is that them writing? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so they'll be able to hear if somebody speaks from the yeah, audience? If, if, um, you might need to repeat your question just yeah. a little bit too far away, but yeah, it should be okay. okay. That microphone's quite good. Just use a big, louder voice if you want to answer the question. <laughs> Communicative and effective value. Do you have any thoughts on the differences between EAL environment and EFL? <laughs> Where students are in a room full of speakers of the same L1. Oh, that's nice. That's a great question. It's hard. <laughs> Let's say, for example, a different country team like just Germany or something. Mm -hmm. Germany is something to when you have foreign experience? I think so. I was, I'd like to clarify that. I'm just kind of dialing there. Yeah, yeah. everyone has the same yeah I'll, ma I'll maybe clarify that. Hello. Hello there. Oh, oh can't hear. So um, we had a couple of questions to start with. Are, are you mm -hmm. receiving us right now? Yes. Can you hear us? I can. There's there's a delay on the uh, on the screen there, so it's kind of strange. It's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> and my my head is really big. <laughs> <laughs> They're all cheering. <laughs> Okay, um, I'll, I'll start then. My first question is, um, <laughs> the students are freaking out here. Um, <laughs> first question I had was, um, this is so strange. Hold on a second, I'm gonna turn off the... live stream. Oh, right, right. <laughs> That's okay, don't worry. 
it'll be there'll be like you see it afterwards. Okay, so uh, first question we had was, um, what is your what's your view on on accommodating different learner expectations? Uh, for example, student beliefs about the role of the teacher versus the role of the student in a classroom, um, which stem from cultural differences. I mean, mm. I mean, is there something that would be said to address that? Is that something that, that should be taken into consideration by the teacher? Uh, that's the first question. Mm. Okay. Are you Shane? Oh, yes, I yeah. am. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. It's nice to meet you. Nice um, to meet you. And our students are here too, so they're enjoying meeting you. Um, yeah, I think the... I think the belief system is something that's really interesting when it comes to language development and, and dealing with diverse classrooms because it's not only the teacher's beliefs. <laughs> Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> it's not only the teacher's beliefs that we're, we're targeting, but we also have to consider our learners and the beliefs that they carry. So I worked in Taiwan for 14 years and one of the challenges that I faced was the beliefs that the learners and the parents carried themselves. And it was, well, this is not how you learn language because you're getting us to talk about grammar, you're getting us to practice it, you're getting us to speak out, and um, you're using EFL approaches. Um, and I found they wanted it much more of a written um, experience for them where they were using a grammar textbook and more of a grammar translation um, experience where they could use their first language to translate into the second. So it wasn't an, an, a spoken opportunity for them, it was more a written. And that was a process that took a long time. I, when I was first, uh, initially as a new teacher, I learned that the hard way because I went in with great ideas and felt like this, this idealist that you know you can go in and, and make changes to education systems but you can't you have to start right where they're at and build that as a process of learning for you yourself as a teacher and for them so that beliefs are challenged but at the same time supported and valued and so that was something of a process that took a long time and I then said maybe we won't do spoken grammar um, opportunities all the time in the class. We'll just do that once a week. We'll, we'll do it the way you usually do it with the structure with the textbook and then one day a week we'll try it this different way and we, could, we do feedback and see what you think. And I invited parents into the classroom and I provided a kind of mini seminar and dialogue session for them to see why we might change the, our practice in that way. I don't know if that answers your question. Does anybody here want to comment on that? Any experiences you've had? <laughs> well, that, that answered it for me. I think we have another question. I think, uh, Dave, you had a question. I'm not sure. Well, we're, we're live now. Go for it. Uh, I think I saw you, uh, I think I saw you catch it before. It's the question about, uh, like, I understand the value, the value of allowing students and the effective value of allowing students to use their L1 in a second BAL mm -hmm. environment. Uh, but I find it's a bit different when you're in an English foreign language environment with a mm -hmm. classroom full of everybody that speaks the same L1 and then it just becomes uh, a super crunch. I'm just wondering if you have any tips with regards to finding that balance. Yeah, that's a great question um, because that's a lot of the debate that we have here too. Um, the we, we're actually doing a joint project. I'm part of an organization. We work with the British Council um, looking at English as an additional language and it's quite a new area for the British Council. But they're coming with an EFL background and they're trying to make sense of why would you use the L1 in class when you're trying to promote English as a, a foreign language. Um, but you can see, talking about belief systems, you can see that changing as we all work together and and share different perspectives and I think that's where EAL and EFL can be similar in some ways but they also diverge. Um, I think we have master students programs here that are predominantly um, Chinese students and when they're engaging with teacher education and all the concepts we often say to them you know use English because that will help develop your language. Um, but then a lot of the time if the concept is hard or the, the grammar rule or whatever it is, whatever context you're in, we allow them to speak in their first language so they can understand it better and then practice using it and applying it 
um, by using English. So I think if the concept is difficult, using the L1 really helps to facilitate cognitive growth and understanding. But um, it is a balance within that. The EFL context is a little bit different to the EAL context. Could you say that again? I couldn't quite hear you. Sorry, so you exercise control over when the L1 can be I wouldn't say control. Um, the students themselves have asked the question, am I allowed to use my L1 when I'm d debating the teacher education <coughs> literature that you're getting us to discuss because I find it easier to talk to my peer in Chinese uh, to gain an understanding. So we kind of give them... We tell them what we're trying to achieve here, the goals we're trying to achieve with you as a teacher. You can make your own decision. But we also say if there's someone in your group who doesn't speak Chinese, that there are five of you that are Chinese speakers and one who's a Polish speaker, it may be not polite just to start talking in Chinese and exclude them. So they, they start learning the rules of communication, what's appropriate, and looking at the pragmatic constraints of language use. So I, there's no rule, I don't think. It's just a case of who your, what your context is. Does anybody want to comment on that here? Yeah? I think it's more important to let them talk about their culture and their home life in whatever way, whether it is in their own language or in their in English language. Because I think it's less... It is all about the value of your language and your culture. So to allow them to speak in their own language, if that's helping continue their culture, I think that that's only a positive thing. Mm. Any other comments? What, what, what's, what's your own experience? Um, what do you find within your context? Yep. Mm-hmm. speak about their own cultures and get them to their language. It worked really well. And then uh, when I was teaching the academy in, in, in New Zealand, which had that obviously, so they were all from mixed, mm -hmm. different mixed race environments. They, yeah. And there were groups that they, they, they were highly motivated to learn English basically to simple survival, but they, it was the uh, communicative value of allowing them to use English as a crutch, whereas comparatively, say, in a foreign language environment here in Korea, uh, there's so often the student's goal is not even necessarily to acquire language. Sometimes the student's goal is just to finish. Yeah. And uh, and so many of them, uh, it's it's difficult to convince them of the merits of um, of English. And I know that I'm just with my own faculty with a number of different approaches, and some people have and insist on 100% English mm -hmm. or controlled English times where they have uh, English discussion like for example planning is allowed in the L1 but all other mm -hmm. at all other times um, it's English only. Mm -hmm. I had tr I've tried to be flexible but I've found that uh, allowing flexible and flexibility and not regulating it somewhat I found that ran away with me mm -hmm. and I found that uh, it was very difficult to rein it was very, it was very difficult to rein back in once you once I've allowed um, a reason why L1 use. Yeah. I think so it's I very I'm, context bound, isn't it? It depends on your context and it depends on your learners and what the goal of your program is too. So I think all those things factor in. Yeah? Yeah, I think it depends on the level of the language as well. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes if, so let's say if you speak English as a second or foreign language and you have to write an essay about it, and if you go back to your monotone and read opinions or journals, it might make it more difficult afterwards conveying the meaning in proper English, academic English, the way native speakers would say it. So mm. the fluency might actually get lost a bit mm -hmm. in that transmission. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. I think yeah. There's different. There's strengths and weaknesses, pros and cons for different things. I think it's how you gauge it yourself, isn't it, and work with it. Oh, thank you. Good questions. <laughs> Do you have any more? 
Yeah, I think we have uh, another question here. Want to just one more? Okay, hello, my name is Hong Gil Yu. I'm the student of GT. I can you hear in Korea? Yes. Yeah. I see you here. Mm -hmm. I have very kind of individual question about your lectures today. Thank you. You said to us that you learned Chinese when you were late 20s. Yeah. Since I'm learning French language now, I'm wondering that did the theory you mentioned about that there is kind of limitation to learn language, did that kind of theory affect you when you learned the Chinese when you were late 20s? Um, can, can you say a little bit more about which limitation you mean? The, the theory you mentioned about that there is kind of limitation to learn language because of our brain, brain, oh, right. brain system. Yeah, the so. Mm -hmm. when you're late 20s. Yeah, well, there, there is a lot of theory that talks about critical age theory. Um, and some of those concepts are more linked to once you get past five, obviously you, your brain is less, your brain is elastic as a child and it's able to take in a lot more, it's able to deal with language in a specific way. But once you're past five, um, that elasticity changes and so you may not process language or learn it in the same way. But I think it gets confused with brain plasticity and, I can't say that word, and um, the, the learning domain and the learning process because I'm, I don't, I think you have, a, if you have a very unique and structured and well um, developed learning process, then you can develop language uh, in a way that's, that's very supportive and, and easy. Um, so I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with the brain theory that says you can't learn language past a certain age. There were certain sounds that I had difficulty making in Chinese and because it wasn't in my own language and I didn't know how to put my tongue in the shape that it needed to be to make that sound and I got frustrated and it took me months of just saying that everywhere I went I just kept trying to make the sound. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a lot of my Chinese learners um, also had difficulty making the TH sound, the TH and would go around practicing that so that's maybe where I would have seen, seen some difficulties or maybe some grammar structures that were quite different. But I don't think, I think that's more related to the shape of the muscle, the tongue, rather than it is to my brain being less elastic because I'm old. <laughs> so, what I mean is that it's the problem of pronunciation, not because of our brain system. Yeah, okay. and, and the first language interferes a little bit with um, how our tongue makes certain sounds. That is the problem. I'm learning now French. That is the same problem. And yeah. It's hard to count properly. You'll get there. <laughs> yeah, you will get there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I don't know if, if you wanted to give much more time. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I was wondering if perhaps, since, since I have you here, um, the students that we have in the audience, these, these are all future educators. And I was just wondering if you could offer some words of advice or, or encouragement to these, because they're all future teachers. Oh, right. Uh, the best we have here, can you? Right, well, we have a whole class of teachers. Hi there. Nice to meet you. Um, maybe we could turn our camera around to our student teachers, and they can give you some advice, too. <laughs> Right, any advice on becoming a future teacher? Our teachers are in the process, they're, well, you can tell them. On you go, you, you say it. <laughs> say who you are, Archie, and what you, what you do. Okay, so I um, am becoming a teacher of English, uh, English language and literature uh, here in Scotland. Uh, and so um, issues surrounding EAL, uh, are particularly important, um, although we are a mixed uh, group of students. Some of us uh, will be language uh, teachers, uh, some of us will be English literature and language teachers, uh, and there are and, history. And history as well, and uh, also really some lecturers as well. Yeah, um, but for certainly as an as a, an English language and literature uh, teacher, I think in our culture there is perhaps a lag. There can be a lag. Um, in technological use, um, certainly 
uh, Yvonne Maid's comment about um, EAL learners finding perhaps increased difficulty in English language in, in English classes, um, at which partially down to the language itself, and partially perhaps down to uh, a lag in in, teach, in teacher uh, responsibility for EAL issues and for providing uh, resources. Um, so I think for a lot of us in here, um, that's that's a big issue to take up to try and um, push ahead. Um, push our classrooms ahead um, and to try and really be very, what's the word, um, yeah, to aim high in our, in, our, in our addressing of this issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other bits of advice? I think it's very important to be open-minded to new ideas and difference. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Sorry, could we, could we hear that last one again, please? That, that sounded... Yeah, I think from nice. personal experience, also throughout my education, what I've seen with teachers, that it's very important that you're open-minded and also open Mind. to new ideas and people being different, having different opinions. Yeah, so open-minded and open to new ideas with people having different opinions. Yeah? I think that a good thing is to not stick to what you plan to do if it goes wrong. It's okay <laughs> to just improvise if it's not working. Don't feel like you have to do what you've planned. Yeah, that's a good... <laughs> <laughs> Don't feel you have to stick to your lesson plan. <laughs> if it's going wrong, that's good. <laughs> Any other well, I guess, bits? I guess being, being creative too yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, because sometimes we get kind of stuck to the, the text, don't we? This is, this is what I've planned and this is what I must do. So we get kind of constrained by that. Yeah. Don't take anything personally. They're teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, we got that. <laughs> <laughs> Any other bits of advice? or? So are you training to become secondary teachers as well? High school of teachers of English or... Did you hear that? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we, did, we missed the question. Could okay. you ask the question? Please? Yeah, maybe we can move the microphone. If you are all training to become English teachers for high schools in Korea, or do you have different kind of specialties? You guys want to answer for yourself? I think, I think what we have, we have, um, there are different specialties among the students. Some are, some are training for different specific areas. Uh, I'm not sure. Is anybody here going to be an English teacher? No. <laughs> but they're, they all have, they're all focusing on different major areas. Um, so, for example, I mean, what are you, math education right here, which mm -hmm. is like a, another foreign language to me, but that's one example. Anyone else? What, what are you yeah. Geography. We have a geography teacher all right. coming up right here. So, I think um, I have an update going on. So, yeah, so it, it, it varies. I think among them. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any comments or anything? Any of us have any comments? No? Let the kids take out. Sometimes yeah. just let the pupils lead your class as well. You don't have to be in charge all the time. If they have something to input, let them do that. Because mm. they can teach you something as well. Yeah. So student ideas are, and contributions are important. And I think, um, I don't know, last word of wisdom. I think who you are as a person communicates so much more than what you teach, the content of what you teach. And so it's developing yourself, challenging yourself, what your values are as a teacher, um, how you striving to be inclusive and and to provide every student to meet the needs of each learner in your class, no matter what differences are there. I think it's being open and I think who you are communicates much lo more loudly than what you're trying to teach. So, last words of wisdom, but it's been great, great to see you all. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. And good to meet you, we'll, Shane. We'll sign off now. Bye, yeah, guys. thank you. <laughs> Bye.
Right, so this one's set up to record the Skype feed as well. I'm just going to boom over and set up another link. Everything looks good.